Hello friend, I have a story to tell you today. It's the story of my daughter's life. She died of lung cancer at the age of 39 and I have written a book, a book which I think is helpful to us today in the very difficult circumstances in which we live. It brings hope and encouragement and a sense that all is well. I hope you enjoy it. Episode 27 A frown creases Claire's forehead. The consultant does not know why Shirley's symptoms have developed so quickly or why she's feeling so bad, breathless and in pain. She's so concerned that she promises to phone as soon as she has studied the PET scan. It's two days before Shirley's 39th birthday. It's a very long day and still the phone doesn't ring. When evening comes, Shirley and Nick sit scrunched up on the couch. They natter about everything and nothing. When it does come, the ringing of the phone startles them. And it is clear. Once the hallows are done, she asks, Shirley, is someone with you for this call? Nick and Shirley look at each other, eyes growing big. Their eyes lock wordlessly. I'm so sorry to have to tell you that even though the treatment brings some regression, the tumours are so aggressive that whenever we stop chemo to allow your body to recover, they are advancing faster than we are. Claire's soft voice trails off when she falls silent. It seems that all they can hope for is to win Shirley a bit more time. I think you should call your parents in South Africa to come immediately. Later, Claire tells Nick, I've never made such a phone call before, not in my entire career, nor did I ever wish to. But my overriding concern was that, since the cancer was so far advanced, Shirley might not have lasted the weekend. Nick and Shirley just sit there. Apparently the scan couldn't be worse. Slowly the world begins to spin. It's business as usual out there, but in here... Yeah, Shirley's been told her life will be over really soon. Nick finds himself thinking, this can't be right. God's going to do an amazing healing. I know that, don't I? I'm so sure of this that I'll stake my life on it. Shirley's thoughts are tortured too. I'm so, so disappointed and I'm angry, God. You've given me really great volunteering opportunities that seemed perfect for me. Everything I've always wanted to do. So where's this all going, God? I can't believe that you will take someone like me who just wants to love you and serve you and let me die. She sniffs, then cries, then sobs. In no time at all, Nick's tears mingle with hers. Very slowly, after quite some time, the storm of emotion abates and all is quiet. Shirley and Nick sip some wine. They begin to talk. Shirley amazes Nick. I have never seen such great bravery, strength and faith. Even now she's thinking of others, not herself. And she's actually talking about getting her will in order and planning her funeral. Nick writes, We started weeks of intimate dialogue regarding Shirley's will, health care and so on. How she did it leaves me in awe. How can you discuss how you want to die, what location, with whom present, under what circumstances and treatment, and then plan your own funeral? At times I was more of a wreck than she was. I could have run from such a task, I wanted to, but I know that this was what God wanted me to do. There was more to it than making decisions, it was about her heart. Her heart was the part of her God so dearly and passionately loved. He wanted her to know that she was dearly loved and cared for and that she had his protective arm around her while she walked this journey. He asked me, alongside her mother, to be his hands and feet, to surrender my own heart and love and care for her unconditionally. So I, we, did. After Claire's call, once Shirley and Nick are calm enough, Shirley phones. 
Mom, she says, I think it's time for you to see if you can get a ticket and come back. As I put down the phone, relief that my wait is over overwhelms me. When Shirley puts the phone down, she turns to Nick. If I am to die, I want to die at home and I want to die well. Before the news, things were looking good, Nick explained. With her birthday coming up, we were planning to do it with some style, with a small group of close friends. We decided the news didn't change anything. We were still going to do a dinner, if Shirley could possibly manage it. As her Saturday night party approaches, Shirley struggles. Her body keeps weakening and breathing becomes more difficult. Pain pushes hard to break through all the medication. Nick glances at Shirley, marvelling as he drives. My life, she looks beautiful. I love the short, sassy wig and the sexy smile. And she's so elegant as usual. How can you not totally adore this remarkably brave, wonderful girl? Once inside, Shirley very soon establishes herself as the belle of the ball. Having a party like this, and knowing it's for her, makes her radiant. She bubbles, giggles, jokes and laughs. She smiles almost non-stop and takes every opportunity she can to hug and be hugged. Sadly, all she manages is a gentle step or two of a dance before someone helps her to a chair. Joe calls Nick over. We are seeing a miracle. Amen, sister, he replies. I'll drink to that. On Shirley's birthday, a day later, Sunday the 2nd of March, Nick stomps up the stairs carrying a tray. Shirley spent the night after the party at his cottage. He plonks a tray full of flowers, champagne and strawberries and cream in front of her. They feast, not without giggles and laughs, and remember the previous night. She's absolutely exhausted, but terribly happy. She tries not to let her thoughts wander, Texts line up, waiting their turn. Cards collect, destined for the top of her piano. Phone calls sparkle with chuckles and sometimes peals of laughter. A few days ago, Shirley listed going to her party as one of her outrageous requests for prayer. Now she texts, Hi, outrageous answer to one of my prayer requests. I got to go to my birthday party last night. Believe me, a few days ago, this felt impossible. Not only was I there, but I was the last to leave. Thank you, God. That Sunday afternoon, Nick and Shirley make their way to Tonya's. Chris has baked a chocolate cake, and Tonya's decorated it with candles and sparklers. Pippa lights the candles, and they sing to her with a lot more feeling than usual. Many times during that day I think of all that's taking place and feel a happiness of a kind. I have managed to get a flight and know that I will be back with her on the 6th of March. Chris, along with us and others, has been so anxious for me to come back that she writes, Just heard you arrive Thursday. So relieved, I burst into tears. It comforts me to write a round robin. What is most alarming is that Shirley's right lung is now filled with tumours and totally out of action. Because she's very weak, her wonderful friends have not allowed her to drive to Oxford. Tanya has had her move in, providing meals and welcoming visitors. So Shirley's not alone, especially at night. On the 4th of March, Shirley writes, Just received a phone call from Oxford Hospital to say the NHS has agreed to release the oral chemo drug Pazopanib to me as early as tomorrow, provided I can cover the funding. Given the amount of money involved, this shouldn't be a problem for my private medical aid. Oh, thank you, God, for answering our prayers. I respond to her news with a text. Wow, I love him, don't you? As soon as she has the energy to write, Shirley confesses, I have to say I had a lovely birthday. I still believe that God has this somehow. It's in his hands in some way that I can't see and can't understand. 
That same day, Katie, pregnant to her and Dave's great delight, opens the door to welcome all who have come to pray. Laura, sad that she can't come, prays with a friend at home. God gives her Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 4, which she paraphrases. Don't be afraid, you're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. You will not go down. I love you. I trade creation just for you. From South Africa, I text, We all love you, love you, love you, and are finding our own ways to say it. So be blessed, praying up a storm with you all tonight. Shirley reports the next day. So, as you've heard, last night was pretty phenomenal. We were all overwhelmed by God's presence from start to finish. We, okay, I, laughed again most of the way through. I'm left with a sense that God is doing something pretty incomprehensible. I don't know what, but it is good. While we were praying, Nick Crowder saw ring upon ring of wagons and angels drawn up protectively around a little girl, me, to keep me safe. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but I am but a bear of little brain. Love you all, guys. The next scan in Oxford exhausts Shirley. Claire examines the results very carefully. The next scan in Oxford exhausts Shirley. Claire examines the results very carefully and sits down to write a report. The PET CT scan unfortunately shows massive progression of disease. She now has good palliative care input. I'm pleased to say her pain is much better controlled today than it was last week when I saw her. She also seems more comfortable with her shortness of breath. We have been through the risks and toxicity of pazopinib. She knows there is a significant risk of a lung perforating and blood clots and stroke and also diarrhea. Relentless, the prayer offensive marches on, and on March the 5th, Tonya and Shirley drive to Hammersmith to hear Randy Clark, who has an international healing ministry. He and his team talk to Shirley and pray. Many pray, especially for the oral chemo. Shirley shakes uncontrollably, overwhelmed by the spirit, and she's blessed with laughter once again. She says, this seems to be my new thing. Could be worse. Both she and Tonya have such a touch from the Lord that in Shirley's words, they were so glad to have been to heaven and back. I've been reading from my book, Mum, Please Help Me Die, the story of my daughter Shirley's battle with cancer. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, please contact me. You can do that at the following email address, thai at mumplpleasehelpmedie.co.za. I hope you'll be with me again next week. Goodbye.